Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, this Memorial Day weekend, Lord, that we can come to you and we can learn more about who you are and how much you love us. And we pray now that you use Pastor Izzy to do just that. Lord, let us just take all those distractions, all our worries and cares away. Lord, let us lay them at your feet. You're the one big enough to deal with them anyway. Yes, Lord. Yes, that now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, anyone else having trouble breathing from the vlog besides me? Just a few of us. So the, the ones of you that are, know my pain, would you please pray for me to be able to continue to... Uh, I feel like i got a band around my chest right now, squeezing real tight. And I do have asthma, but, you know, what, last week a guy came up after the service and uh, saw that I was sick. And um, he was visiting with Cookie over here. The gentleman was sitting to my left. And he said, oh, could I pray for you, Pastor? He said, you got a headache and fighting that cold thing and... And i just like to pray for you. I said, if that's all right. I'm like, yeah, twist my arm, okay. So he, he, we're by the truck over there, and he, he says, can I put my hand on your forehead? And I said, of course, you know. And he puts his hand on my forehead, and he presses on real hard. And I had a really painful headache last week, those of you know that have been fighting that flu thing going around. And he put his hand on my forehead and prayed over me, and the headache went away just like that, snap. And he goes, how's your breathing? And I said, terrible. He goes, well, can I pray for that? I'm like, dude, keep going, you know. <laughs> I mean, what am I going to say? No. Just like so sometimes, you know, it's so simple. The scripture says when you're sick, it says that you're supposed to call for the elders of the church and have them lay hands on you and pray for you. There's a scriptural, like, prescription for what to do. But it's almost like our culture says, ah, that, you know, we'll go to the doctor first. And then we, when it last ditch effort, if nothing else works, will might ask for prayer. I submit to you, I thought, wh why didn't you tell me that you would pray for me before the service, you know? Except Aaron would have got out of, he, he got to preach for me last week because I was feeling crummy, but, but if he could have just prayed for me, I felt great after that. I was so grateful for, you know, how many believe prayer works? It, do, it actually does, we're not talking to a blip of nothingness, we're talking to God Almighty. And as we studied two weeks ago when I was teaching, we were in 1 Corinthians 15, and we were going over this gospel message that Paul said the things that were of the first importance, the greatest importance in the gospel. And he said there was three, three main points to the gospel, and we only went over the first one. The first one was that Christ died for our sins. It says, according to the scripture. And so we went into the the. Old Testament, now according to Scripture, meaning the Old Testament Scriptures, that's the only Scripture that Paul had at his disposal back then. The New Testament wasn't written yet. And so I submitted to you, if you had to share with your friends, maybe, maybe if you have a Jewish friend, um, the message that the Messiah, the Christ, would have to die for our sins. Where, where would you go in the Old Testament to tell them that story? Because it's in there. You know, and, that, and by the way, you can't use New Testament on the Jewish folks today. They don't, they, they're not going to accept that. So you need to be a little bit savvy of where the, me the gospel message is through the whole of Scripture. It's not, you know, we're, we're not just New Testament Christians. Although, you know, I was taught, what's the best commentary? Matthew Henry, you know, Haley, different Bible commentators. Or when, when I was being, going to Bible school, they told me the best commentary for the Old Testament is the New Testament. And the best commentary for the New Testament is what? The old. They don't, they're not separated. They go together. And so we went over two weeks ago how, how in the book of Genesis, the, the patriarch of the Jewish faith, Abraham, was tested by God. And he was told to offer up his son, his only son whom he loved. And who was that? Isaac. And he took him to the mount. And we went over that in Genesis 22. We saw how the Lord, you know, right when he was about to, to plunge a knife into his son on the altar, said, stop, and said, and, and, and there's a ram right there caught in the thicket. Use that instead of your son. And then it was spoken by Abraham. Now, this is important that you know this. If you're speaking to a Jewish person, it's good to go with their, 
they're heavy hitters, so to speak. Go with, you know, they really respect Abraham. And Abraham said, from this day forth it shall be said, Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah, the name of the Lord God, is a, it's a title of the Lord Almighty. And he, and he says, the Lord Almighty shall, what? Provide. Provide. Now, the Hebrew tense of Jireh is different. We don't have an English tense like this, but it means that he shall provide now, in the present, in the future, continuously. It's present continuous. I don't know. That's the best way I can explain it. In Hebrew, it means, it doesn't mean he had, and it wasn't past tense. He didn't say, Jehovah Jireh, God provided a ram. Whew, didn't have to offer up my son. I mean, didn't have to sacrifice my son. No. In fact, he said, it shall be said as it is to this day in the mount of the Lord, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide himself a lamb. It's a strange way of putting it, but it's literally that God will make himself to be the lamb. <clears throat> so in the scripture, we have this promise that God is going to be the lamb. Now that's why it's so important when, when Jesus does appear, he comes and, he's, and then angels announce him, Emmanuel, behold, today a king is born for you. And this one is going to be the Savior. And he shall be called Emmanuel. Who can tell me what Emmanuel means? God with us. So this one baby that was born, Jesus, was God with us. But, but when he grew up, 30 years later, John the Baptist will point to this same person and say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, this is really important for you to know because to a Jewish person, you're trying to point them to the promise of the fulfillment, what Abraham spoke, Jehovah Jireh, God shall provide himself a lamb. God will make himself to be the lamb, and he did. And you say, but that was his son, Jesus. Well, Jesus, they asked him, show us the Father. What was his answer? Have I been with you so long a time? If you've seen me, you've seen what? You've seen the Father. I and the Father, he said, are one. He came to reveal the Father to us. But if he would have revealed the, the Father to us in his power, in his might, God showed up in his power, oh, man, we'd just be like, we, we, we'd be zots, you know, little shrivels, just crispy critters. If, if he showed in his full glory, we wouldn't make it. So Jesus humbled himself, laid aside his godhood, and became God incarnate, God in the flesh, so that we could approach that, that, that gap that had been broken, he would come and pave the way to, uh, to make the way back to the Father. Now, this is a message that was given from the beginning. From the beginning of the scriptures, from Moses, from the book of Genesis, when God kicked him out of the garden, God said, I give you a promise that through your seed, there's gonna, this one seed will come. And what seed was that? The seed of the Messiah. The promise, now if you're going to talk to a Jewish person, you have to use their thinking. The seed has to come. The promise has to be fulfilled. The promise that was made to, to all the way back to Adam, then repeated to Abraham, to David, to, to uh, God kept con continuously repeating that he would send a savior. And so the idea that he would come and die, even the type of death, I didn't have time to do this, but for those of you note takers, you can do a little extra credit reading. In Psalm 22, we went to Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53 with the suffering that the Messiah would go through and how he would take upon himself our sins and, and for our, the chastening of our well-being, our peace would fall upon him. By his stripes, it said, we would be what? We'd be healed. But in Psalm 22, those of you that are... are students of the scripture, you know, that's a psalm that proclaims the very method in which the Messiah would die. How he would be tortured, tor he would be beaten, how he would be put on a cross. How all of those things were foretold. So those are good things to know. When you're going to explain that, that Christ came and that he would die for our sins, it's good to know a few Old Testament scriptures, maybe Genesis 22, Psalm 22. Isn't it neat how they're the same? You can, easy to remember. Those two scriptures, by the way, are very, very powerful because they point out the suffering that the Lamb would take for, for our sins. And then we read here, it says that, that 
Well, this message isn't new. So turn with me to Matthew 16. I want to show you something. Now, if anyone would know how the gospel message is to be fulfilled, I always go with my heavy hitter, and that's Jesus. He knows the whole story and how it's going to play out. But it's interesting to me that his own disciples, they don't know. In fact, they think they're so genius. Matthew 16 is the passage of Scripture where, where we read that, the, the, that Jesus took his disciples to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And there in Caesarea Philippi, he, he asked his disciples, it's, it's a beautiful oasis in the desert there. There's a, there's a spring that comes out of the rock, makes into like a, a little pond and then a trickling water away from that. And he was there with his disciples having a, a little private retreat time in this oasis in the desert. And he said to them, he said, who do men say that I am? Do you remember this? And they said, well, some of them say you're John the Baptist, verse 14 of Matthew 16. Some of them say you're Elijah. Some of them say that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Now, who can tell me which guy piped up with that answer? You, don't look down. I, I, too late, right? You already did. Okay. Simon Peter, that's right. Simon Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, good job. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. Bar is in Hebrew, son of Jonah. Blessed are you, son of Jonah. You have, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven revealed this to you. Now I can and Jesus said then, and I say to you that, that you, you are Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. But then he warned the disciples that they should, not, that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. He asked them, who do you say I am? And Peter gets it right. You're the Christ. And Jesus says, good job. But you didn't come up with that yourself. Where did he get the revelation that he was the Christ? What was his source? God's, he said, God has shown you this, right? He said, you have received this revelation by my Father who is in heaven. God gave you a, a heavenly revelation. Now, I, I'd hate to be the other 11 guys with Peter about now. I don't know if you ever noticed these guys kind of competing all over different stuff. You know, I was there first. I outran them. John's telling about how they went to the grave, you know, and how Pe he outsprinted Peter. Then slow and steady Peter came in, and he went in while John was just peeking in from the outside, you know. They had to, like, tell who's the faster runner, just to go along with your sermon last week. They even threw that in there, you know. But they, they were constantly competing. I can just see Peter going, Whew. did you hear that, guys? I'm tuned in, man. I have a revelation from God in heaven. I know who he is. He's the Messiah. I got that from upstairs. Remember, who got it first, guys? None of you got it. You thought he was Jeremiah. You thought he was Elijah. No, I'm the one that got it. He's the Messiah. See, I got that. I am tuned in. But you know, in the very next passage, the very next paragraph, Jesus preaches the gospel in its most simplistic, most bones broken. I mean, the, the, the basic bones of the gospel is done in just one paragraph from Jesus. Listen to this. Verse 21. You might want to highlight this, by the way. Matthew 16, 21 tells us, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and that he must suffer and many things he would suffer from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and he would be killed, and he would be raised up on which day? The third day. Jesus told them, we're going to go to Jerusalem, and they're going to, the, the, the chief priests and the elders and the scribes are going to, they're going to, they're going to make me suffer. And then they're going to kill me. But I'll be raised up on the third day. Now, Peter, the guy who just had that heavenly revelation from God, Peter took him aside, verse 22, and he rebuked Jesus. 
And he said, God forbid it, Lord, that this should never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on the interests of God, but on the interests of who? Of man. You know, Peter, you, you had a revelation from, from God one moment, and that revelation was correct, that I am the Messiah. I am the Savior of the world. But is, I, I don't know about you, but I take great comfort in this. If Peter, the Apostle Peter, who was with Jesus, the guy who actually walked on water for a little stint before he looked at the waves and freaked out, got his eyes off Jesus, then he sank. By the way, never take your eyes off Jesus when you do, you know, scary wave walking. You'll make sure, stay focused. I mean, he was in the storm. He was doing good until he took his eyes off Jesus and looked at the storm, right? And then what happened? He sunk. But he got to walk on water when he had the right focus. And you think, he had the right revelation from God that Jesus was the Messiah. This guy's on a roll. And isn't it comforting that the guy that had such good track record goes from not perfect to, um, well, he goes, he goes from revelation from God one minute to revelation from where? From Satan, from the pit of hell. This guy, this guy's ping-ponging all over the place. I got a revelation from God. You're the Messiah. And the next revelation is, you don't need to suffer. You don't need to die. You don't need to be raised on the third day. That would be wrong. God forbid it. And Jesus calls him on it. Get behind me, Satan. That revelation is not from God. That revelation is from the pit of hell that the Messiah would not have to suffer, that the Messiah would not have to die, that the Messiah would not have to rise on the third day. Because if Jesus would have gone with what Peter was saying right then, how many of us would be saved? None. This was the requirement according to the scriptures that the Messiah must come, he must suffer, he must die, he must be buried, he must rise again three days later according to the scripture. And Jesus is telling his, his own disciples this. And Peter's going, I don't like this. This is a bad idea. God forbid it, Lord. You shouldn't do that. And Jesus says, get behind me. Say, now, if some people, I grew up Italian Roman Catholic, so we were taught that Peter was the first pope. Problem is Peter didn't know about it. Okay? He was made the Pope in about 300 A.D. He'd been dead a long time by now. You, you figure he dies in the 60s, 70s of uh, A.D. Um, you know, 230 years later, the Catholic Church made him a Pope. The guy was already dead. But, but they say that Peter is the rock on which the church is built. Because Peter had this revelation that Christ was the Messiah, so he's the rock that the church is built upon. And if that's the case, then he also said Peter was Satan. Right? Get thee behind me, Satan. If you go literally what Jesus spoke to him, you can't do that. That's not, you're, you're, missing, the, you're missing the context of what was delivered. The, the context is the revelation he had was that Christ was the Messiah, the Savior. And upon that rock, that truth, that Jesus is the Savior of all of us, that is what the church is built on. That's the foundation of the church. Christ crucified for our sins. That's the foundation. Not Peter. That Peter had that revelation is the foundation. Because if you call Peter the, the very foundation that the church is built on, and then you have to be as literal when you say, get thee behind me, Satan, when he's talking to him. Then Peter, Satan. So God built the church on Satan? No. No way. You can't do that. So don't use that, that understanding that Peter was the rock that the church was built on. Use the revelation that Peter had that Christ Jesus was the Messiah, and then you can build the church on that. That he's the one that came. Now, Jesus said it clearly. Three steps. I must come, I must suffer, I must be killed, and I must be what? Raised. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, amazinggracekona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. 
That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.